All right. I can take direction. <laughs> it's good to have you here this morning. We're going to get into the word. Uh, we're in a series of called Major Lessons from the Minor Prophets. And we're going through some of the unknown prophets or ones you might not spend much time with or in. And remember when I said uh, the prophets, you know, we have one idea of what that might be. I think of them as covenant lawyers. Understanding this covenant that we've made with God and what God asked us for understanding the deficiencies in the covenant and coming with a word from God calling us back to the embrace of the covenant and a walk into blessing. Uh, So far, we've seen them uh, really addressing some hard situations. Today, um, I've got to be honest, I had a few guys, because Chris is on sabbatical until August 15th, There's a couple of our guys, Tom was last week, and Jonathan's coming up once, and Rob's coming up once, and I said, you guys can pick your favorite minor prophets, and I'll work with what's left, and I'm glad no one took Haggai, Uh, because Haggai is, for me, one of the most encouraging of the minor prophets. I love love this story, and so we're going to get into it, and I'll probably take way too long introducing it. The style of the book is prose versus poetry. And here's a Bobism, like don't build everything around this. But I find in prose, God's really communicating his thoughts and a message and and kind of, it doesn't seem as, as feelings, his feelings are in there as much. And when I read poetry, I get the feelings more. And, and so this book seems to be very, very direct and to the point and, and it has a, a very direct message in two chapters. Don't know a lot about Haggai. I think his whole message came over four months. Uh, but where it happened is just absolutely fascinating. Um, I go all the way back to reminding you guys that uh, way back when the people of Israel divided into two tribes. Solomon's son came in and the people said, hey, the taxation burden's too heavy and His advisor said, yeah, you should back off. And he got some young people around him that weren't older and wiser. And they said, ah, you should just tell them how hard it's going to be. And you had 10 of the tribes separate from the tribe of Judah. So you had Israel to the north and Judah to the south, 10 and 2. And uh, we, we then proceed to have this story of a bunch of leaders and kings and priests that take them away from, that allow a whole bunch of idol worship and different things to come in. And God keeps sending them prophets saying, hey, if you don't straighten up something, you know, I'm going to have to bring something bad. And you know, return to me, return to me, return to me, return to a right standing. And finally, as predicted, the Babylonians, or the, uh, sorry, the Assyrians conquer the north. And uh, pretty much they are wiped out. You still have Jerusalem and Judah, uh, and again, the prophets are saying to them, you guys need to straighten up, and we find that the Babylonians in 587 come in, and they take them into exile. Uh, You would know the story of Daniel, and you would know some of the writings of Jeremiah, and off they go into exile. They're carried off. It's how the Babylonians did things. You didn't get to stay in your area and plot insurrections or this or that. You got displaced as a people group, and you got put where they put you. And Jeremiah says, you're going to be there a while. Plant gardens, build houses, bless the place that you're in. But when it comes to the city of Jerusalem and the homeland, uh, they ripped down the walls of the city. They destroyed the temple. They destroyed the houses. Uh, there was nothing left. They took you out of there. Seventy years this has been established principle. I got thinking about that and thinking 70 years back, um, you know, my mom's parents escaped uh, during the Bolshevik Revolution Uh, My grandma tells a story of selling her wedding ring for enough bread to feed my one uncle that was born. And and if I just go 70 years from there, if somebody had said, uh, hey, you know what, you could go back, uh, I I wouldn't know what to go back to, would you? I I would have no picture of it. I would have no, 
And, and these guys had the promises, but they've been living in the center of this trade. Babylon was a really, really advanced city. What they enjoyed economically and the commerce and trade and the marriage and the, the friendships, they, they had a life all settled in. And 70 years go by, and the Medo-Persian Empire comes in, a guy by the name of Cyrus, and he destroys the Babylons, and he employs a new strategy. He comes to all of these displaced people groups, and he says this, under a few conditions, I'll let you go back to your homeland. Well, you know all the prophecies about Jerusalem. You know all the prophecies about the temple. And you know that they're starting to get excited about this, that if they can truly believe it, And so here's what he says, that you can build no military, you have to send taxes back to me, but if you want, you can go, the only other stipulation is if you rebuild any house of worship, you have to agree that you're going to pray to your God on my behalf. And so I'll take all the prayers I can get from whoever it is you're praying to, and to do that, I will even offer you a stipend, some financial help. So he gained amazing loyalty from the people, and there's this group, this remnant, the the courageous few, I called them, who got together, who said, we believe that God wants us to go back. We know prophecy. We believe this return would be important to God's presence as blessing and the future of the people of God. What do we know about this bunch well, here's just a hot guess for me. Like, do you guys like those shows with the pilgrims that go out or the, the, uh, the people that set out to settle the West and explore and they took off on wagon trains? And Don't you ever wonder, like, how did you get in a boat not knowing where you're going to go or where you're going to end up or how did you get in this? Didn't you, you heard about all this danger. Well, these were the courageous few. They were willing to adventure, Right? They were willing to exchange the known for the unknown. And I don't think it was just the spirit of let's have some fun, let's do something new. I'll go a step further and say I really believe their faith was that great. I really believe that these were the ones that were sold out. That God is going to do what he said. And just like Abraham and just like others, we're going to take that step and back we go. Exchange the known for the unknown. They took great economic risks. They left friends behind. They left security behind. We know this about them. They're not going with the flow. Uh, We know that they numbered a great many at this point. And the remnant, the Bible tells us, was about 50,000, not a huge group. It tells us who the leaders were. Zerubbabel, interesting guy. He's in the line of David. He's a prince. And so all that prophecy about Jesus coming from the line of David, like he had an important part to play in going, but he was born in exile. He's only heard about Jerusalem and the temple and Joshua, the high priest. Well, off they go, given their bit of money. They get back and they find everything as bad or worse than they thought. Uh, They have to get some kind of tillage going again, some kind of economic trade. The walls of your city protected you from raiders and marauders like they were broken down. You could read the book of Nehemiah, right? And they know that something important has to happen, that the, the temple, the center where the presence of God was, so they erect an altar And they lay a foundation. The first two years are a bit exciting. They're going to get to work. And so while they're getting themselves settled in a home and building this foundation, uh, they're excited about what's to come. And then Darius usurps Cyrus in the Medo-Persian Empire. And don't you love a new leader? Changes the programs, right? Social program, gone. Said, so, you know, I need this money for my military advancement. All the guys in the military here are going, oh, that's understandable. He goes, there's no way I'm going to give you money to buy goodwill for you guys to go back and build your things. So they lost their funding. And they started to become quite discouraged. They had the Samaritans opposing them, telling them it couldn't be done. And as they looked at the economic conditions and the meager things they had to work with, 
but we know they became really discouraged. In fact, the Bible tells us they were convinced that they were doing the right thing, but their conclusion was our timing must have been wrong, must not have been listening. The arrival of Haggai finds this as this scenario. He's going to speak to God's people who are discouraged. So if you're here this morning and you're like, man, my, my reality doesn't look at all like I anticipated. Discouragement is my friend. I think Haggai has some things to remind you of. But he's speaking to godly people. He's not coming in saying, you bunch of regenerate... You need to change everything. These are people that are committed. They're the faithful. Speaking to people suffering an economic disaster, there's an absolute struggle for survival. We're going to know through the book that there has been over and over and over a struggle for them to produce enough food and to have enough to sell and trade. And they really feel like, uh, and this is Bob, okay, so don't build you. I always sit down and go, don't build your theology on this. This is what I think. I get the sense that they were, you know how you can get a victim mentality? Like, we were the faithful, we went and did it, we deserve more. I get a sense they almost fell into the victim mentality. But here's where he arrives. They're confused about what God wants. We thought we were doing what you wanted, and here we're in a roadblock, we're stuck, and yet the arrival of Haggai finds them still absolutely responsive to God. 25 times in two chapters, The Lord Almighty says, and they obeyed. So let's have a look at these several messages over four months. I'm going to read the whole book, but let's start with the first 15 chapters. 15 (laughs) verses. Verses. (sighs) Just one week. Just one week. In the second year of King Darius, on the first day of the sixth month, the word of the Lord came to the prophet Haggai, to Zerubbabel, son of Shetel, governor of Judah, and to Joshua, son of jo- Josadak, the high priest. This is what the Lord Almighty says. These people say, the time is not yet come to rebuild the Lord's house. Then the word of the Lord came through the prophet Haggai, Is it a time for you yourselves to be living in your paneled houses while this house remains a ruin? Now, this is what the Lord Almighty says. Give careful thought to your ways. You've planted much, but harvested little. You eat, but never have enough. You drink, but never have your fill. You put on clothes, but are not warm. You earn wages only to put them in a purse with holes in it. This is what the Lord Almighty says. Give careful thought to your ways. Go up into the mountains and bring down timber and build my house so that I might take pleasure in it and be honored, says the Lord. You expected much, but see, it turned out to be little. What you brought home, I blew away. Why, declares the Lord Almighty. Because of my house, which remains a ruin, while each of you is busy with your own house. Therefore, because of you, the heavens have withheld their dew and the earth its crop. I called for a drought on the fields and the mountains, on the grain, the new wine, the olive oil, and everything else the ground produces, on the people, the livestock, and on all the labor of your hands. Then Zerubbabel, son of Shittel, Joshua, son of Josadak, the high priest, and the whole remnant of the people obeyed the voice of the Lord their God and the message of the prophet Haggai because the Lord their God had sent him and the people feared the Lord. Then Haggai, the Lord's messenger, gave this message of the Lord to the people. I'm with you, declares the Lord. So the Lord stirred up the spirit of Zerubbabel, son of Sheatel, governor of Judah, And the spirit of Joshua, son of Josadak, the high priest. And the spirit of the whole remnant of the people. And they came and began to work on the house of their Lord Almighty. Of the Lord Almighty, their God, on the 24th day of the sixth month. Now, I'm going to go fairly quickly. Uh, There's lots here. You guys can get 
into it and dig around in it. But I love this where he just starts with, a, um, let's rethink your priorities. I'm going to clearly identify your current reality and your feelings. God starts with what they're saying, and they're saying something that's not true. They're saying, now is not the time. It's the right thing. It's just not the right season, not the right time. Ever told God that? You've kind of been convinced that this is what you should do. You, you, you've actually run into truth. This is what I know he wants from me. But there's been a million excuses about why this isn't the right season or time. One day. When? He goes on to say this, consider your situation. He kind of says to the people, sit back and just take a look. Here's the way I see it. Let me give you the big perspective. You yourselves are dwelling in paneled houses. Now, that is actually, we could spend a whole bunch of time here. Let me just put it this way. It means they've upgraded and renovated and their houses are current. It means they've gone up into the mountains and got wood and come down, and they're not just basic shelter. They've, they've gone ahead and padded the place a little bit and upgraded a little bit. And it says, you're living in paneled houses while my temple is in a ruins. You've lost sight of the goal, the thing that you were on a mission to do, the thing I commissioned you to do. And so we get this reality check. He says... Just look back and consider what's happened. Like over and over, your crops haven't produced. You've sown this much, but you've only harvested this. Uh, you drink and you're not, you eat and drink and you're just not satisfied and full. Like there's just something missing. And then this is the one I identify with. You have pockets with holes in them. Ever been convinced that that $20 has just gone missing? Looking everywhere for it. I, oh, wait, I'm old. Okay, kids, your debit card. No. That, that should may when you run into them not make me not make you resent me but make you turn towards me so that I can get your full attention and, and we can have this conversation because the longer this goes the more everyone around is just going to see that the temple's a secondary priority that this whole blessing what we enjoy isn't because of the source of who we honor he says, my house needs to be finished so that I'd be honored and glorified and I could take pleasure in it. Consider your ways. Again, what a fantastic minor prophet book. Thank you that I got this one. Because they heard the voice of the Lord and they obeyed. They're like, oh, right. Oh, no. All right, let's get together. Up into, the, up into the forest, let's cut some wood, let's get, it, let's get on this project. And it says they obeyed, it says they feared the Lord, they recognized this was from God. And said, so thank you for the correction, we're on it, here we go. And here's how God spoke to them, he said, I'm, I'm with you. And he gave them spiritual fervor. It's that awakening in the heart that excitement for the things of him. Well, the next message from Haggai is about clar clarified expectations. We're seven weeks into the job when we get this. And the people are looking at the footprint and it says there's some there that are old enough that they remember the glory of Solomon's temple. And they're looking at what they're able to scrape together and they're going, We're, we want to be obedient, we want to do this, but this is pathetic pathetic in comparison. Like this doesn't represent at all how we feel about our God and what he deserves. 
In Ezra 3.12, you have some of the older priests saying this, but many of the older priests and Levites and family heads who had seen the former temple wept aloud when they saw the foundation of this temple being laid, while many others shouted for joy. No one could distinguish the sounds of shouts of joy from the sound of weeping because the people made so much noise, and the sound was heard far away. Now, I'm going to give our PowerPoint person a challenge. I want to jump one slide to Haggai 2, 1 to 9 and read it and then go back to that slide. We'll try. On the 21st day of the seventh month, the word of the Lord came through the prophet Haggai. Speak to Zerubbabel, son of Shealte, governor of Judah, to Joshua, son of Jozadak, high priest, and to the remnant of the people. Just an aside. I was going to say those names different every time and see who caught it. I, I know I'm weird like that. Sorry, mom. Yeah, she's watching online. Um, ask them, who of you is left who saw this house in its former glory? How does it look to you now? Does it not seem like nothing? But now be strong, Zerubbabel, declares the Lord. Be strong, Joshua, son of Jehozadak, the high priest. Be strong, all you people of a land, declares the Lord, and work, for I am with you. This is what I covenanted with you when you came out of Egypt, and my spirit remains among you. Do not fear. This is what the Lord Almighty says. In a little while, I will once more shake the heavens and the earth and the sea and the dry land. I'll shake all the nations, and what is desired by all nations will come, and I'll Fill this house with my glory. With glory, says the Lord Almighty. The silver is mine. The gold is mine, declares the Lord Almighty. The glory of this present house will be greater than the glory of the former house, says the Lord Almighty. And in this place, I will grant peace, declares the Lord. So if we went back two frames, he says, and I messed this up because my computer quit when I blew a fuse and It's a long story. Be strong is given three times. And it's given to the leader, the prince, the priest, and the people. So he's not even saying be leadership. Hey, I'll give you a message. You pass it on. He gives it to everybody. Be strong. Be courageous. And he gives them a why. Look at the why. So if you're here this morning and you're discouraged about some things and you go, man, you're right. I I was on mission and I've kind of taken my eye off the ball. And be strong. Why? Why? I'm with you, I'm faithful to the covenant I've made, I have all the resources, he says the gold's mine, the silver's mine, don't sweat how big, and he's gonna provide the glory. We know that this is the temple Jesus will one day come through. Skip ahead with me. We're at two months into the program of the four, or two months later into this program, And he's coming back, and he's got some legal issues. And and he really, let's read it. Skip down to the passage again. I'm sorry, kiddo. Haggai 2, 10 to 19, and then we'll go back to the slide. I really did mess this up. Hmm. How about that? On the 24th day of the ninth month in the second year of Darius, the word of the Lord came to the prophet Haggai. This is what the Lord Almighty says. Ask the priests what the law says. If someone carries consecrated meat and the fold of their garment, that fold touches some bread or stew, some wine, olive oil, or other food, does it become concentrated and the priest consecrated? And the priest answers, no. Then Haggai said, if a person defiled by contact with a dead body touches one of these things, does it become defiled? Yes, the priest answered, it becomes defiled. Then Haggai said, so is it with this people and this nation in my sight, declares the Lord. Whatever they do and whatever they offer there is defiled. Now give careful thought from this day on. Consider how things were before one stone was laid on another in the Lord's temple. When anyone came to a heap of 20 measures, there were only 10. When anyone went to a wine vat to draw 50 measures, there were only 20. I struck all the work of your hands with blight, mildew, and hail, yet you did not return to me, declares the Lord. 
From this day on, this 24th day of the ninth month, give careful thought to the day. When the foundation of the Lord's temple was laid, give careful thought. Is there yet any seed left in the barn? Until now, the vine and the fig tree and the pomegranate and the olive tree have not borne fruit. From this day on, I will bless you. Now let's skip back. He poses two legal issues. He basically says this, can you transfer holiness and can something clean be defiled by something unclean? All right, kids, I know you're in the service. This, water came out of the same jug at the back, okay? No, it did. And and I went out and just off the path there, I scraped up a little dirt and some pine stuff. Um, can I clean this water by putting some of this clean water in it? Anyone? No? So if I just put a drop of this in, would you come drink this? Oh, wait, I won't ask that. (laughs) I know some of you. I know some of you, right? He says, well, the second legal question then is when something is unclean or dirty, and we know this from flying on a plane and everyone around you coughing and giving you a cold, If something's infected, you can infect others, right? So if I took some of this dirty water and put it in here, it would no longer be drinkable. I mean, you could, but it tastes terrible. Correct? So he's trying to say something really profound. Saying your heart and why you're doing it matters. That holiness, what's going on, can only be a heart issue. It can't be gained by simply doing the right things. Proverbs 15, 8 says, The Lord detests the sacrifice of the wicked, but the prayer of the upright pleases him. That outward practices don't purify the heart. And so what I've done is withheld some blessing from you and withheld some things from you that you might look to me, that we might be restored to right relationship, that this thing would be balanced because my desire is to bless you. How many times when something's withheld or our holes have pockets in them or our disappointment is profound or we become the victim? Do we kind of say to God, why are you doing this to me? Instead of asking the question, what am I supposed to be learning and looking at? What is it you're trying to draw me to and teach me? Well, my time's gonna run out. Let's finish the chapter and we'll ask the big question. 24th day of the ninth month in the second year of Darius, the word of the Lord came to the prophet Haggai. This is what the Lord Almighty says. Ask the priests what the law says. Oh, wait, I read that. The word of the Lord came to Haggai a second time on the 24th day of the month. Tell Zerubbabel, governor of Judah, I'm going to shake the heavens and the earth. I'll overturn royal thrones and shatter the power of the foreign kingdoms. I'll overthrow chariots and their drivers. Horses and their riders will fall, each by the sword of his brother. On that day, declares the Lord Almighty, I will take you, my servant Zerubbabel, son of Shetel, declares the Lord, and I will make him like my signet ring, for I have chosen you, declares the Lord Almighty. What I want you to see is this affirmation of a big picture. God has said, I'm doing my will and work in the world. We know from the book of Revelation what's coming. We know uh, how God orchestrated events uh, that his son would come and that sin and death would be conquered and the covenant relationship with us would be established. We know that there's no human might and no plans of people that he doesn't, ha- doesn't have absolute control over and is orchestrating. And for Zerubbabel, who was facing all kinds of opposition and struggle, uh, especially from certain groups, he said, you're part of my plan. My face is on this thing, and my signet ring is there. And if you go to Matthew chapter 1, I believe it's verse 12, Zerubbabel is mentioned in the genealogy of Jesus. How cool is that? What he's saying at the end of the book is, don't forget I'm at work to my faithful, to those working in obedience. I'm at work, I'm here, you can trust me. The covenant's there, blessing's coming. 
Just follow me faithfully. All right, big question. Yeah, here we are in Cold Lake 2024. Uh, This was a long time ago, Bob. A couple of things I don't want you to leave here missing. If you've walked with Jesus a while, if you've stepped out and taken some risks, and maybe you're, you're just feeling tired and discouraged, or maybe you've quit. Maybe you said, uh, enough of that. I want you to realize that the faithful need encouragement. That it's okay to get distracted. And that God is faithful to send a message along and send somebody along to call you back on mission. Maybe you forgot that we're here to grow and develop gifts, not, not just to serve and bless one another, but to be his witness and his representation in the world. That we have the most incredible news of all time. Maybe you started building too many walls and moats around your perfect little life when there's people dying and drowning and This morning, my son and I uh, were putting a motorbike in the back of his truck because he was on his way back to Calgary. And uh, we drove over to the Iron Horse Trail. And it's a great place to load a bike if you've never done it here. It's perfect. And I backed his three-quarter ton in, and he's on the bike, and I hear voices, and then there's this tent, and these two people come out of the tent. And so I interact with him a little bit. I'm feeling stressed. I'm late for church. and No, late for me. I was here. And I just wanted to show them kindness. I wanted to know their story. How did, how did you end up here? Is it, and is there anything we could offer you that would perhaps just perhaps give you dignity and value and, and let me share Jesus with you. It was a good conversation. I'm here. I don't know. They were on their way to McDonald's when I last saw them. But the faithful need reminders and encouragement. What was it you set out to be a part of and to do that has perhaps waned or you've lost track of, or perhaps in the urgency of life and building your paneled house, you've simply believed it can't be done. Whatever it is, we have a great message this morning. Because it's easy to lose sight, become distracted and discouraged. It's easy to believe that circumstances are what needs to change for us to do it. The economy would have to be different. Something would have to turn around. When all we really need to do is renew the mission that we're on. And that our sending is from him and all we need comes from him. Secondly, don't leave here without considering your ways. I'm not going to take a long time this morning. But if, you're, if you've got pockets with holes in them. Uh, there's a huge portion of the New Testament that talks about finances, wealth, and where it comes from. I'll just say this. If your practice of recognizing God off the top first isn't there, that's a great place to start to look into Scripture. And that sometimes... When all of your hard effort and all of your investment and all of your planning and all of your human scheming isn't working out the way you thought, it'd be great to sit down. We've got some really mature, wonderful, wonderful believers in this place who would love to just walk you through the principles of that, guide you through that, and go, this isn't health and wealth. This isn't you put a quarter in and get $2 out over here. This, is, this isn't, I'm not selling any of that. But I'm saying possibly... You're operating in such a way that you can't experience the blessing of God and he's trying to get you to look for his principles and practice them. Because in general, he wants that blessing to be yours. Thirdly this morning, I guess I would use this story to say this. 
I love how they just renew obedience. They heard from God and went, right. Oh, yeah, let's go. And then look at the excitement that follows. And so right away when they trust God and then they say, oh, yes, we're going to go, you see God saying, hey, I'm with you. And then you see him stirring them up on mission. And then you see that whole thing lifting off and going again. And this morning, if you're like, that sounds good, I should just force myself, it could be that you have a heart issue. You want to know what cleanses this? It's the cross. He says he removes your sin as far as the east is from the west. He's faithful to forgive. Man, if... if if you got some heart issues, if you got some hidden sins, some stuff in your life that you got to deal with, if there's been things that you've been resisting God on, the invitation is so cool. Because it's like, just respond, just repent. Just come to him. So he wants you to have this. Actually, he wants you to have life and have it to the full. Let me pray for you.